you guys. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're watching this. Um, so we have another kind of long chapter today, chapter 12. Um, so I'm going to explain the questions and then uh, I'm going to hop right in. So we have two questions for chapter 12 today. The second one, super self-explanatory. You're, you're good. Super easy. You've got it. Um, the first one, um, you have to explain what the first sentence of this chapter means. Like, what do you think it means? Why did they, the author write it the way that they wrote it? Um, stuff like that, okay? So, um, when I get started, take a good listen to that first sentence, then we'll pause, I'll kind of explain it a little bit, um, and then you'll be able to answer that question. Cool? All right, here we go. Like I said, long, uh, long chapter again, um, but we got this. Here we go. <clears throat> chapter 12. The old man stood on the top of the bank, taking the measure of Dead Men Valley, watching the cold wind bend the trees below. Okay, so what is he doing? Why is he doing it? What, is, what does that sentence mean? Okay, that's what you need to figure out. Okay, he's standing on top of something taking the measure of dead men valley what do you think that means taking the measure is does he have a measuring tape and is he going around and measuring everything or what is he doing okay um and watching the cold wind bend the trees down okay so he is kind of taking note about everything that's going on okay so kind of come up with your own answer but that that should help you out here we go. He was scanning the high mountains that had encircled us. What was he thinking? Were we going to stay here now? Our remaining moose meat couldn't have weighed 25 pounds, but Johnny had those three bullets. Our lives were in his hands now. A quick fire and dry clothes, a lean-to and a night's supply of firewood, then darkness. A little dried fruit to eat, and the howling of wolves across the river. I was utterly exhausted and I had a deep ache in my side pain, uh, pain whenever I breathed or moved. Had I re-cracked a rib? Wolves in the valley should mean moose, Raymond grunted in my, in my direction. Johnny Raven was looking into the fire as he warmed his hands and feet. He seemed to be letting his mind drift and I couldn't blame him. How did he keep going? For such a gentle man, he was tough as nails. There's a simile for you. This bare ground will make tough moose hunting, Raymond said, holding out his hands to the fire and stamping his feet. I wish it would snow for about four or five feet. That's when the moose stick to just a few trails so they can get around. Sometimes they stand right in on snowmobile trails. They won't even get out of the way. I can't believe we're hoping for snow, but I see what you mean. Could we even get around? We've got the moose hide. Johnny can make snowshoes now. Tomorrow, I bet he finds some birch and starts making the frames. Without him, I didn't even want to finish my sentence. Raymond finished it for me. Yeah, without him, we're dead meat. The old man stood up. By the light of the fire, he started stowing what was left of our moose meat in one of the army boxes. Then he picked up the rifle, motioned for us to follow him, and started to walk away. I was confused, and so was Raymond. Where did he want us to go? I wasn't about to force an explanation from him, that was for sure. I thought of grabbing the flashlight, then remembered it was dead. As the crescent moon disappeared behind the mountains, towering over the valley, we walked into the darkness, following his silhouette. Beyond the firelight, the stars were blazing in the brittle, dry air. Even with only a few patches of starlight, or sorry, few patches of crusted snow here or there to reflect the starlight, my eyes adjusted and I could make out where I was going. We followed the old man upriver as, from nowhere and everywhere, Curtains of iridescent green and yellow light materialized in the night sky, swirling and shimmering and dancing. The northern lights. 
My father had often told me about them, the Aurora Borealis. I stopped to stare at the dazzling aurora, shifting in a, in a moment from horizon to horizon, returning just as fast, this time like brilliant searchlights. I ran to catch up, and then I walked with my eyes on the eerie lights and their strange shifting shapes. Okay, so what I want you guys to do with your parents, okay, do not do this by yourself, but with your parents, I want you guys to look up what the northern lights look at, look like. Okay, you may either look up Aurora Borealis or you may look up the northern lights. They'll come up with the same exact, um, uh, same exact searches, I think, yeah. <laughs> um, and then what I want you to do is create your own kind of uh, northern lights. Okay, you can do it with flashlights, you can draw it, you can um, use chalk on the sidewalk to, to um, do your own Aurora Borealis. Send me pictures, send me a video, I'd love to see what you guys created, okay? Um, here we go. Where a small creek, almost frozen shut, reached the Nahani, the old man turned away from the river and led us into the big trees. Then he pointed, and we could make out a small cabin in the clearing up ahead. The cabin was glowing yellow-green under the light of the aurora, and it looked like an apparition. It looked like a ghost, like something not really there. Nearby stood a food cache on tall stilts. Patterson, the old man said, pointing at the cabin. Johnny knew about this place, Raymond exclaimed. He must have been here before. Johnny Raven fashioned a torch from a rolled piece of birch bark. By its light, we lifted the cabin's latch and swung the door open on creaking hinges. We stepped over the door sill, door sill, which was the shaved top of a second log up from the ground. The torch light fell on a small wooden stove in the corner and sections of stovepipe laying on the dirt floor. About 13 feet square and tall enough for us to stand even in the corners, the cabin had a couple of shelves and a crude handmade table. And that was all there was to it. Above the table, the initials RMP and GM were carved large into the logs, along with the inscription, Dead Men Valley, 1927. The old man pointed at the initials and repeated that name, Patterson. Trapper, Raymond muttered to his great uncle, and the old man nodded his agreement. You knew him, Raymond asked. He pointed at the name, then looked back at the old man. You knew him? Johnny was nodding vigorously. We returned to our campfire for the night. Raymond and I stayed up close to the fire as Johnny wrapped himself in his blanket, lay down, and slept. At least we have a cabin to stay in now, I said. A cabin with a stove. We can stay warm. Do you think that plane will come back? Take a look around here. Oh, we should get a signal fire going in case it does, Raymond said. Maybe build it here and use driftwood so we can save the wood near the cabin for the stove. I just wish I hadn't lost that meat. You're pretty lucky to have me along, you know. You wouldn't want this to be too easy. With a grin, Raymond said, If I ever do another raft trip, I think I'd want to have you with me. You're pretty good on those oars. He placed a big chunk of wood on the fire. Johnny will get another moose, he said confidently. Do you think Johnny wants us to stay here for the rest of the winter, if no one spots us, I mean? Maybe we'll be able to hike down the, uh, hike out down the river later on the ice once there's no more Chinook. I just don't know. I think we better just take our cues from Johnny from here on out. <clears throat> you won't get any back talk from me on that. Now, isn't it interesting? That has totally changed from earlier in this book, right? Um, Gabe is now willing to listen to Johnny. A couple chapters ago, he was like, dude, you're insane. Why are we staying here? We need to go where we need to go, which ended up being a terrible idea. So I think it's a really, really good idea, to, or a good thing that we're seeing this character development in Gabe that he's becoming a little more humble, he's becoming a little more willing to listen to other people. A couple chapters ago, that was not the same, same game, right? 
In the gray morning twilight, we built up our signal fire by the river, then began moving our stuff. The squat cabin with its thick roof of moss and clay looked as miraculous as before. We broomed the dirt floor clean with spruce branches, brought our gear inside, and moved in. The stove looked to be in one piece. We fitted the stove pipe back together and ran it up through the roof jack. The big roof poles looked sound. The one window had been broken out, but a sheet of hard, clear plastic had been fastened across the entire window frame. The window allowed quite a bit of light. Home, Raymond announced. It was the 21st of November. They've been doing this for three weeks now. They've been surviving in the Canadian winter for three weeks. This is impressive. I love this book. Oh my gosh. Okay. We tried a fire in the rusty little stove. It worked and cheered us up as we warmed our hand. hands. I looked around the cabin, ending up with my eyes on the rough little table. This must, must be the kitchen, I said. Needs a microwave, Raymond added. No TV in here either? Next time, we should bring a VCR and watch movies all winter. For those of you that may not know what a VCR is, okay? Back when I was a kid, okay, we would have these things called VCRs. This is how we would watch movies. We didn't have DVDs until I was maybe in junior high. That was when it became a thing, okay? So these VCRs, let's see, are about are about this this big, okay? Maybe a little maybe a little shorter, maybe a little thicker, but it's approximately this big, okay? I just pulled a book from my bookshelf. Um, and we would put it in to the VCR and that is what would play our movie. Okay? So Raymond's saying, "We don't have a TV, we don't have a VCR, but man, next time, let's bring that so we can watch movies." Now is there going to be a next time? Hopefully not, right? Um, but that is why, uh, they're trying to, they're trying to keep it light, have some humor, make this, uh, go by a little bit faster than what, uh, than what it is. <clears throat> there you go, I said with a small laugh that made my side hurt. But in the back of my mind, I re was remembering Clint's story about the two brothers who tried winter in Deadman Valley, starved to death, and lost their head to the bears. The old man pegged the moose hide to the wall with the old nails we found around the place and began scraping the hair from the hide with the sheath blade. He was going to make it into rawhide, babichi, as Raymond called it. Raymond and I sawed three big rounds of spruce to, to serve as stools. We allowed our spirits to lift for the time being. All that remained of our food was a little flour, baking powder, some beans, a handful of dry fruit, and the box of meat. Raymond and I fashioned a ladder so we'd be able to reach the food cache behind the cabin, trusting that meat would come to fill it. Up, to fill it. Like a cabin in miniature, uh, like a cabin in miniature on stilts, the old cache was supported by four trees that had been sawed off about twelve feet above the ground. Just under the cache, the stilts were wrapped with stovepipe to prevent a black bear or wolverine from reaching the cache, Raymond said. What about a grizzly? I asked. Grizzlies can't climb, he explained. It's out of a grizzly's reach. As Raymond predicted, the old man took us out right away on a hunt for just the right birch tree. He had us cut a ten-foot log from it and carry it back to the cabin, where he planed it flat on two sides with the axe and began to strip it into lengths. The old guys like Johnny always use birch for snowshoe frames, Raymond said. It's tough, it'll bend without breaking, and it splits easy, easily when it's cold. Around noon the next day, it cleared up enough for us to notice the sun making a brief appearance over the bald mountain to the southwest. The temperature was 10 below, practically a heat wave. When I returned from building up at the signal fire, I found Raymond watching intently as Johnny fashioned a snowshoe frame, bending the green birch strips patiently over his knee, bracing and lashing them temporarily into shape with whittled pe pegs and fine spruce roots. 
I watched for a while until Johnny picked up his rifle, said something to us in Slavey, and slipped into the trees. He returned in the dark. No luck. On the 25th of November, the warm Chinook returned. By day, it would blow through the valley, almost at gale force, so super, super hard. And by night, we could hear it high above, raging on the ridges. The Nahani opened up in spots, smoking in the cold mornings. The Chinook would alternate with the Arctic winds and pitched battles that seesawed back and forth above Dead Men Valley, sending the temperature from 40, be for, from 40 above to 30 below. Still no snow. It was not the weather that Raymond had hoped for as Johnny hunted our side of the river for the moose that should be browsing in the willow thickets. Raymond and I were picking frozen cranberries. Any we could find helped a little. We'd gone through the last of the fruit and the flower, and the ration of meat we were allowing ourselves could barely keep us going. We still had beans. For our only meal of the day, we'd been allowing ourselves no more than one pound total of the moose meat, cooked in with some beans. When the old man wasn't hunting, he was weaving the intricate babichi lacing to complete the first pair of snowshoes. Raymond and I were making, um, were making snares braiding the thin strips of babichi as Johnny had showed us. We set a dozen snares up and down the river for snowshoe hares. Raymond knew exactly how to do it, having snared the rabbits with picture wire when he was a kid. He'd bend the young tree down over the rabbit, run and rig the snare below it so it would make their circle about four inches across and about three inches above the trail. Then he'd arrange slender sticks like a fence on both sides of the snare and tiny ones underneath, so the rabbit was forced to pass through the circle. Once we interrupted a chase in the trees above us. A dark furred animal the size of an overgrown house cat hunched its back and growled at us as we passed below. Martin, Raymond said. In the next tree, a red squirrel chattered as the martin glowered at us, growling all the while, trying at the same time to keep its eye on the squirrel. I tried to knock the martin from the tree with a stick, but succeeded only in chasing it away. Raymond was always on the lookout for fresh moose traps, but he wasn't finding any. All these willow thickets, he kept saying, all these moose paths, paths old droppings everywhere, but none of them fresh. I don't understand. The old man showed Raymond that the airplane cable we had salvaged could make a snare too, just like a rabbit snare, only on a bigger scale. It's illegal, Raymond said, but in Dead Men Valley, he added with a smile, we might get away with it. We rigged the snare on one of the more prominent moose, moose paths through the thickets. As Raymond secured the free end to a cottonwood tree, he said, man, would I like to get a moose for Johnny. That's the way it's supposed to be. The young men are supposed to bring the first and the best meat to the elders. Wherever we went, we took the ax with us for protection. Nobody walks around in the bush without a rifle, Raymond said. I told him, that looks more like an ax you've got in your hand. It's better than a kick in the knee. Where do you come up with that expression? My mother always used to say that old Dene saying, he replied with a smirk, an axe. It's protection from what? Bull moose, cow moose with a calf, or keep out of its way. I thought grizzlies were supposed to be hibernating by now. Supposed to be, he said. With the axe and the bow saw, we made so much firewood for our little stove, it looked like we had a woodlot going. We sought out the dead trees and hauled them back in lengths to the cabin and sawed and split firewood endlessly, mixing in green spruce, which split easily in the cold. With the Chinook in retreat, perhaps for good, there is plenty of cold available. We each broke a saw blade sawing too fast. When the second one broke a few days after the first, it scared us. We'd have to baby the bow saw now that we were down to the last blade. The mercury stayed down around 20 and, 30, 20 and 30 below at midday. It amazed me that life could go on. Yet, as long as we dried our clothes out overnight and dried our gloves and mitts and the felt liners from our boots, we were okay. Bundled up in as many layers as we were, we'd become accustomed to it, the cold. 
The old man made a simple handheld drum from a small piece of moose hide that he stretched over a birch frame. It looked something like a big tambourine. He'd tap out a simple rhythm with a small padded stick, sometimes chanting on into the night. The drum had a hypnotic effect and helped take our minds from our hunger. Just as we never spoke about the search plane that didn't come back, we never talked about our hunger. It clawed at us from the inside, a private torment. So that's a metaphor, private torment, clawed at us from the inside. Is hunger actually clawing them? No. At least it was warm in the cabin. That small space would easily, was easy to heat if we just kept stoking the fire. After we would regretfully snuff out the candle for the evening, We'd lie on the spruce bows of our, in our bags and watch the bit of firelight from the stove door playing on the drum stand and, and the ancient face of the drummer. Each evening, old Johnny started with a slavey formula that Raymond knew and translated as, in the distant time it is said, Raymond explained that Johnny was telling stories of when the world was young. What are they about, I asked. Oh, like about the raven, how he made the world and then unmade it so it, was, so it wasn't perfect anymore. How he made mosquitoes and made water to run downhill. How he played tricks on everybody. There's even a story about the flood, like the one in the Bible. There's stories about animals back when they were human. Stories about giants and supernatural beings. About heroes. About medicine men who could communicate with ravens and even take the shape of ravens. The elders have all sorts of stories. All the time, Johnny kept building the snowshoes. My eyes kept going back to the finished pair standing in the corner. They were truly works of art with their graceful curves and intricate rawhide webbing. On the 5th of December, it snowed six inches of dry snow, then cleared off. The sun appeared over the bald mountain only 10 minutes before it set again. Raymond and I kept felling trees in the twilight, hauling logs to the cabin, splitting wood, and checking our snares. Over the next week, we caught three hares, white as snow, and always frozen solid by the time we discovered them. We had to bring the rabbits inside the cabin to warm them up enough to gut and skin them. Some years, Raymond said, the rabbits were everywhere you looked. There was even a legend about hares falling out of the sky, like snow. Looks like we might have to live on rabbits, I said to Raymond. The moose meat and beans aren't going to last much longer. There's no fat on rabbits, he replied. We're going to need to find something with some fat on it. They always say your body needs to burn fat when it gets really cold. I could see his face growing thinner, and I knew mine could be too. I guessed I had already lost 15 pounds. The last of our moose meat was soon gone. I was lucky enough to get a grouse with a well-thrown stick was a tasty little morsel, but it didn't take the edge off our hunger. Still no fresh sign of moose, and we hadn't heard wolves since we first arrived. Raymond was worried about not hearing the wolves anymore, and I asked him why. No wolves means no moose, he said. The wolves follow the moose in the winter, hoping they can get one in deep snow. On the morning of the 16th of, se of December, we opened the cabin door and found Dead Men Valley transformed. Two feet of snow had fallen in the night. All the forest was draped it with snow, and the high mountains all around were taken on the unreality of a painting. It was all so beautiful and so clean, the pure whiteness of it all. Johnny walked over to the snowshoes in the corner, and to my surprise, he was motioning to me. He wanted me to try them out. Good deal, I said to Raymond, and we all pulled on some clothes. Outside, Johnny helped me step into them and lace up the bindings, and then I took off like a horse out of the starting gate, I guess. I hadn't gone 15 feet before I tripped and did a face plant in the snow. I thrashed around, spitting snow out of my mouth and trying to get back up, but I was getting all entangled, making a spectacle of myself with my arms and legs and those five-foot snowshoes all windmilling around. Raymond and Johnny were laughing their heads off. Hey, I thought this would be easy, I called. As soon as he could quit laughing, Raymond said, you gotta keep your tips up, Gabe, or they get caught in the snow. I think you better let Johnny use those now. It's a good day for him to track moose. Johnny was still chuckling 10 minutes later when he stepped into the snowshoes and laced them on. Raymond handed him the rifle and said, 
Good luck, Johnny. Just then, we heard wings thrashing the cold air and looked up to see a, ra a raven directly above calling, Gagaga, gagaga. Raymond whispered, It's saying, Animal, animal. It struck me that Raymond said this as a matter of fact. He went on to whisper that ravens were known to lead hunters to game, knowing that they would get their share from what the hunter couldn't use. The old hunter was watching as the raven tucked its wings and rolled over in the sky before flying on. Johnny winked at Raymond and nodded with a smile. My father says it's a good luck sign when a raven does that, Ray Raymond explained. It means the hunter will have good luck that day. An hour later, we heard the rifle shot loud and clear, upriver in the cold, dry air. Moose in the cooking pot, I said, certain as if I'd seen it fall. We waited as the hours passed, and then, when Johnny hadn't returned by two, we had misgivings and started after him, post, post holing our way through the sn new snow without snowshoes. We found where the trail of the man first intersected the trail of the moose, fresh, fresh with droppings and urine. And then we followed the trail of the man, which looped away from the moose's trail, then came back to it every quarter mile or so. Johnny was staying downwind, Raymond explained. We found the rifle cartridge in the snow, showing where the old man had stood when he fired the shot. As twilight deepened, we found the place where the moose had bolted and run. No blood in the snow. Not a fleck. I guess Johnny missed, Raymond said. His words hung in the cold air like death. The raven in the nearby tree caught our attention as it walked back and forth on a dead branch, squawking and squawking. His belly is empty, Raymond said. He was counting on a moose dinner tonight. Gabe, I think we better get back to the cabin. My boots got a little wet. So did mine, I told him. We better get back fast. Johnny was sitting by the stove in his bare feet. He glanced up at us coming in. We were throwing off our boots and our socks. I massaged my toes with my fingers. They're okay, I told Raymond, and he said, Mine too. We could see in the old man's mournful eyes that he'd never caught up with the moose. He looked at Raymond and said something in Slavey. No medicine, Raymond told me. I wondered if they were talking about some medicine that had been prescribed back in the hospital. Let's look in the first aid kit, I said. Dene medicine, Raymond explained. It's like power and good luck. Different people have medicine for all sorts of things. Hunters have good medicine for different animals. Johnny thinks his medicine for moose is all gone. It's because of how he left the moose above the, fall, above the falls. When you don't treat an animal respectfully, its spirit is offended, and then you won't have any more medicine with that animal. That's what happened. Do you think that could be true? Do you believe it yourself? I don't know, Raymond said. I've heard that kind of stuff all my life. It's not very scientific, I know. I guess I don't know what I think about it. But at least we know there's still moose in Deadman Valley, and he has two shells left. That could have been the last moose, Raymond said. To me, it sounded like he was just as convinced as the old man that we destroyed our luck. So that's the end of the chapter. All right, if you have any questions with the um, packet, let me know. I'm here to help you guys. Otherwise, peace out. Bye.